Welcome to the 214th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with New York Times bestselling author, Dean Koontz. Dean Koontz's latest novel, The Silent Corner, is in bookstores today. Stay tuned for the interview. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Dean Kuntz, a writer who doesn't need an introduction at this point. But just to recap, Kuntz's books are published in 38 languages, and he has sold over 450 million copies to date. 14 of his novels have risen to number one on the New York Times hardcover bestseller list. Dean, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me there again. Sure. Well, you have a new novel out today, The Silent Corner. For those who are listening who haven't heard about The Silent Corner yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, it's a it's a thriller. That's that, that's for sure. I always hope the books are a little more than whatever genre they're in. And uh, uh, it features a female FBI agent, uh, Jane Hawk, who is on leave because uh, she is first in grief, her husband committed suicide, or so she thought. But she begins to investigate this and comes to the conclusion he was murdered. And as a consequence, she becomes an agent who has gone rogue and is the most wanted person in the United States by the end of the book. So it's it's a, it's a little bit of a tech thriller. It's a little bit of a, uh, a police thriller, and it's a lot of... Uh, about the human heart and the darkness and the light in it. Uh, that isn't a thumbnail sketch exactly, but it's about the shortest I could make it. Sure, sure. Well, you've mentioned in previous interviews the creative moment when you wrote the first pages of Odd Thomas. Do you remember the original creative impetus for Jane Hawk's character in The Silent Corner? Yeah, this book, uh, I always think I've, I've been inspired in all the ways you can be inspired. And, uh, I've had a Paul Simon song uh, inspire one novel and a, a, a Mel Gibson movie inspire another one, and uh, things come at you from different ways. But this one was very different in that I wanted to write something that was um, of the moment that had a feeling of the world that we're moving into, uh, this tech world with its its ups and its downsides, and a kind of fragmenting culture uh, that we seem to be in. And this goes all the way back to a year and a half ago when I started this first one. And uh, I thought it might be something of a series, though I didn't know it would be more than three books. And all I knew when I started was the character. I wanted to write a female agent of the FBI who was um, different than any uh, female lead in a suspense novel I'd written before or read before. I wanted her to be uh, incredibly tough, but have this deep tenderness in her um, that uh, comes out in certain moments. And I wanted her to have this kind of real attitude, uh, but a very different kind of attitude. I started with all that kind of vague stuff, and I thought, how am I going to introduce the book? And that was another thing that was unusual. I decided to start introducing her not as you might normally, not start out telling you who she was and that she was an FBI agent gone on leave or anything. Just start with her on the road in a motel room at when she wakes up. And then in a series of little chapters, short scenes, pay, pay out tiny bits of information about her. At the same time, you're creating more mysteries. And I had no idea where this was going, Jeff. <laughs> I was in a little bit of a panic for a while, but I think I got about 15 or 20 pages into the manuscript, and I thought, ah, I know where, I know what the central threat is going to be. Uh, it's going at what sort of, it's going to have a sort of what I would call Crichton esque element to it of, of the current technology that has a potential dark side. And, uh, uh, so she kind of grew chapter by chapter, and I got to about seven chapters, and I was looking at it and said, you know what, I think there's maybe way more than three novels with this character, because in the first 15 or 20 pages, she had developed such depth, 
And by the end of the book, she had become probably the, the favorite character I've ever written about. And the next thing I knew, I was right into the next one, and I've done three, and I'm halfway through the fourth. <laughs> uh, she's really swept me away, so I've had a great deal of fun with her. Well, that leads right into my next question, because I, I know that the second Jane Hawk novel, The Whispering Room, has already been announced and will, will be published in January 2018, a little over six months from now. So as of today, uh, what are the plans for Jane Hawk? Do you know how many novels at this point? Uh, you know, I had to sit down. We uh, we sold uh, the books uh, to Paramount TV and a production company called Anonymous Content, and they were sold back in the end of last year, so uh, long before publication date. And at some point, they came to me and said, well, we know the first two books, and you're almost done with the third, but where does this go? Uh, what happens with all this? Is, do you have an endpoint to this first story with Jane? Now, each of these is essentially meant to be a standalone book, but then there is an overriding arc of stories um, also. And I said, at first taking a little affront at this, I said, I don't write outlines, and I don't, uh, I never know where a book's going when I start, but I said there, there will be a conclusion. Well, that isn't good enough because if we've got an interested showrunner and we need to see the, the arc of this. And I said, well, in the first um, adventure of Jane's, I see it as being about seven books. So I had to sit down, which I have not done before, and create for them a rough outline of where these seven books went book by book and where the last one would end with the resolution to this uh, conspiracy that uh, takes her on this long journey in the uh, initial introduction to the series. And so I know where it's all going now, uh, except <laughs> I also know me. And it's entirely possible by the time I start the next book, it'll be going somewhere different than I told them. But there is a resolution to how all of this can be solved and the world safe in the course of it. So so we may. So what you're saying is we may end up with a Game of Thrones situation where the TV show <laughs> diverges from the books. You know, you always have to, <laughs> you, you just have to have that open in your mind that that could happen. As long as they are uh, uh, intelligent enough to, to do the right things with it, then that's all right. Now, I will say they, uh, I, I said that I don't want to be terrifically involved in this. I want to just keep writing these books. But I gave them a list of things that can't happen with Jane. And that was all accepted as part of the beginning of this. So, um, And I won't tell you what those are. Cause that was, <laughs> <laughs> but there's just certain things I said, wherever you go with it that's different, eventually where I end up, um, you can't do this, this, and this to her. I think there were three different things, maybe four. <laughs> so we'll have to come back and talk about that at some later date. <laughs> <laughs> So is, is there anything that you can say yet about the TV project that you just mentioned? Not too much, except that uh, they, they optioned all the books, not even knowing how many it'll be. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's a, a lot of smart people who've made edgy but stylish stuff. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of confident I won't fill, fall into the wrong hands here. Uh, uh, but, you know, I haven't had great luck with the film medium in the past. So this is so far looking like it'll be a change for the positive. That's great. Well, um, to, to shift gears a little bit. So so you've discussed in many interviews uh, your childhood, uh, specifically your childhood with an alcoholic and abusive father. And I'm curious, do you think that your writing and creativity over the years helped you deal with kind of the aftermath of, of that childhood and living with that as an adult? Um, I would say absolutely. In fact, I've said um, sometimes that um, in spite of my father, who, for those who don't know, was a violent alcoholic who held 44 jobs in 34 years with periods of unemployment scattered throughout, and he lost some jobs because he punched the boss and you don't hold on to your job or certainly don't get a promotion that way. And uh, so, and we were very poor and never knew if we had a roof over our head the next day. And, uh, but I, I have said in a, in a strange way, he gave me my career because 
uh, growing up, I knew everything you shouldn't do uh, well, if you wanted to have any way a degree of successful life. And it also drove me to books as an escape. So I, I got into books fairly early and was able to get out of that environment by disappearing into worlds of fiction. So in that sense, it certainly helped me. And one of the things I said when giving notes to the television people on this, uh, on these seven books was, uh, uh, what some of the themes of this are. And one of them is the role of dysfunctional families in some of the worst things in our society. And Jane herself comes from a premier dysfunctional family. And she herself, her father is a concert pianist and famous, but, uh, they're estranged and I won't go further with that. Uh, cause I don't like to give away details, sure, but sure. Jane herself is a terrific, uh, pianist and could have had a career as a musician, but instead gets into law enforcement. And that really is, is sort of, she's driven to that by what the dysfunctional events in her family were. And, uh, so she is driven into law enforcement where I am driven into the creative. And, uh, and in both cases, we can blame the father for, uh, where we have ended up in the life, uh, in our life path. And, uh, so yeah, I think it had a lot to do with where I've went creatively. It has a lot to do with the themes I touch upon in books and, uh, um, and in this particular book or this series, there's this this element of free will. It's some of the technology in this book is meant to take away people's free will. And uh, I, I again won't go too much further, but when you're living in an impressive environment, where as a child you have no power, uh, you you feel that you're something's being stolen from you. Uh, your, your freedom and so forth. So that's a theme of the, this series too. And, uh, uh, I, I can say that comes out of my childhood and cathartic. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I suppose it is. If it wasn't to some degree cathartic after all I've written, I should try some other path like, uh, you know, therapy of one kind or another. Uh, so you just mentioned this idea of escaping into novels and escaping into fiction to deal with, uh, your childhood. Do you ever think, do you ever sit back and think about, um, some of your readers doing the same thing with your novels? Uh, I get a lot of reader mail. Uh, uh we get thousands of letters a year and, um, there is a, an element of that for sure. That, uh, and, and especially when people find out you've had some sort of uh, background like that. When I wrote a little bit about it in, uh, the memoir about our dog Trixie, A Big Little Life, um, I just touched upon it lightly and I started getting even more mail from people who come out of similar dysfunction and and wonder how you get past it and put it behind you. And one thing I sort of say to them is, uh, look, there's a thousand things you can say that therapists say. Are any of them helpful? I'm not sure they are, but I said one thing that helps me uh, and I had said it to a number of people. Uh, look, uh, if if you uh, if you let all of that that happened to you in childhood become a thing that you can't let go of your entire life, if it shapes your entire life, then you let the bastard win. And is that what you really want? And it's kind of a, a, a kind of a hard way to put it, but it it is exactly what help me uh, because I was determined that it, all of that wasn't going to shape my life as his had been shaped. Sure. Well, some writers, when they've reached a certain level of success, tend to relax or not write as much. And you've <laughs> written many novels. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, you've sold millions and millions of copies of your novels. What do you feel drives your crea creativity and passion in 2017? It's, uh, it comes back to, uh, First of all, if you love what you're doing, it, it isn't work. And it, I get up at the, well, now I'm trying to get ahead on a certain projects. And uh, so I'll get up at 4.30 in the morning and shower and take the dog out and get her a breakfast. And I'll be at my, be at the word processor by six in the morning. And I'll work straight through till five o'clock. Uh, and 
I do that anyway, six days a week, sometimes seven, and it can get a little more intense than that right at the end of a book. And yet it isn't work to me because I'm having so much pleasure in it. And that pleasure comes out of all these years of challenging yourself. Uh, now, one of the things that I've always had trouble with publishers is I have not always done the same book twice in a row. I I will move to different genres. I'll, I'll blend genres in different ways. And publishers, if something works, they want you to stay with it and do the same thing over and over and over. I've never been comfortable with that. Um, and as a consequence, however, I've I've fallen in love with storytelling, I think, in a different way than I would have if I had done the same thing over and over. I've written so many different types of books, uh, and each one is a challenge. And if you meet the challenge with some level of success, now, whether the reader or the critics think so is another issue, but if you feel comfortable, you've reached a certain level, then that motivates you to keep trying new things. And you get to my age and my point in life. And you're writing for entirely different reasons. You're writing now for the love of the writing, and I write for the love of the language. The English language is absolutely beautiful and offers so many possible stylistic opportunities that uh, I'm never uh, never going to be able to experiment and use all of them. So that's what keeps me going, just sort of the fun of sitting here. In a, and a scene goes really well. There's a scene in Whispering Room. I won't say what it involves, but it comes late in the book, and it's a terrifying sequence with Jane where she's going after this billionaire who lives at the top of this building and the floors on both sides of the floor he lives on, uh, the floor above him and the floor below are complete security floors. And there's something on one of those floors that she has to go through. And it's when I got to it, I thought, when the idea hit me, for what she was going to have to face there. I thought, now, is this jumping the shark? Is this so far over the top? And I looked at it and thought about it, and I thought, if you bring to it a certain style in the telling of it, a certain uh, very richness of imagery and so forth, it'll work. And I wrote it, and it's the scene in the novel that everybody in my publishing life is reacting to the strongest. Uh, so that's the kind of satisfaction you get uh, after you've been at it this long, and it's the fun of seeing if you can pull it off. Great. Well, given your years of writing fiction, is there any core advice that you would offer someone who is trying to write their own short stories or novels? Um, you, I, I say, and I think it's, it's true in all times and places, that... Uh, too many people, when they think about launching a writing career, look around and say, what's very hot right now? Uh, and for many years, it was vampire novels. So everybody rushes off to do a vampire novel, thinking with that, I'll have the easiest shot of getting in. Except at, there comes a time when nobody wants any more vampire novels. And if you've written 12 of them at that point, they say, oh, that's the writer of vampire novels. And they're, they're not interested in you anymore, even if you've moved on to do something else. So I always sort of say, don't scope the market. Don't try to say, what do they want? And I'll write that, and that will make it easier to market. Just do what you're passionate about, and the passion will come through. And that passion may change from time to time, and that's all the better, because then you don't get labeled. Um, and uh, it's very hard to avoid labels. Um, and all my career, I've been labeled one thing or another. Idiot, very often. But <laughs> but uh, horror writer was one that I never would allow uh, Putnam Berkeley to put that word on the books. And yet they would sell it sometimes in what the cover was before I had cover control. Or they would I'd get the catalog, and it wasn't the word wasn't on the books, but it was all over the catalog. And it took me a long time to get past that label. Uh, so I always advise if you can stay away from labels because you'll regret them uh, sooner than later. Um, and I don't know, there's a lot of uh, things I can recommend, but, and certainly one of them for me is if you're reading and there's whole area, there is some area of fiction you're really passionate about. Don't read only in that area, read everything it can get your hands on. And, uh, 
that's what I've always done. I've read in every genre, and there was a period of a decade or more, probably two decades, where my wife and I each read about 200 books a year. Uh, we didn't have a television uh, at first because we couldn't afford one, and then because we just didn't want one. And uh, that was one of the best things I ever did, was read thousands of novels uh, in all everything from the classics to the latest detective story. And uh, it just feeds your imagination. And it also shows you all kinds of techniques and, and ways to approach stories that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of on your own. Well, what books, what, fiction what, or nonfiction, have you read recently that made an impression on you and that you would recommend? I, I read, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction for this series as research. Uh, the Jane Hawk books are the most research I've ever had to do. And I'm always doing research for any book because I just hate getting a letter by somebody in a specialty saying, yeah, well, the book was great, but you really screwed up this detail. So I always want the research to be right. But the, this Jane Hawk, she's living off the grid on the run from every law enforcement agency in the country. And that's what the title, The Silent Corner, refers to, that people who can who can exist, move largely freely about and use the Internet without being uh, cornered or tracked through it um, are in the silent corner where Jane is. And uh, so I read an enormous amount of research on all of that, which is fun in its own way, but... I read a nonfiction book not too long ago by Paul Johnson, the British historian, uh, called Intellectuals. And it starts with Rousseau and goes to Hemingway. And it's about, I think, 14 or 15 uh, intellectuals uh, who had some profound effect on society. And he tells you what their private lives were like. And it's hilarious, but it's also terrifying. Uh, because most of these were the messiest private lives, and many of these people were absolute monsters. His point in writing this book is uh, self-appointed intellectuals, which is basically the only kind there is. There are uh, don't let intellectuals near the levers of power because they don't care about people; they only care about their ideas. And that book uh, was just fascinating. Uh, and that's unfortunately my pleasure reading time for fiction now is two weeks at Christmas. So I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping to change that, but uh, right now I, I, uh, I haven't gotten there. Sure. Well, we're drawing to a close with this interview, but as a longtime reader, I don't think I can let you get away without asking any hope of a final Christopher Snow book. <laughs> so are, yes. are you, would you be willing to let James Patterson write it at this point? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I have part of that book done, uh, and I did say, I did reveal recently a little bit of why what happened there. When I first came to Bantam, uh, I had moved from Putnam to Knopf, and there was just there were a few things at Knopf that were not happy making for me, and uh, so then I went to Bantam, and I, the first book I did at Bantam was Fear Nothing. And the second was Seized That Night, the first two, Chris Snow. Uh, and the first one was well-received by the publisher who lured me over to Bantam. Uh, but he did not like the second one. Uh, he, it, it, I think it had too much humor in it for him. The fantastic element in it was too much for him. And it was, it was an argumentative period. And I thought, here I am at a new publishing house. I do not want to move again. Uh, because here I'll be moving to, you know, all the time I'll be moving house to house if I keep <laughs> this up. So I, I thought the best thing is to say, look, I'll put a pin in number three and I'll do a couple of other books first. So I did False Memory and and then uh, From the Corner of His Eye. And then I was doing One Door Away from Heaven. And all of these were enormous books. And uh, somehow or other, we just went on until uh, without going back to this. And I intended to go back to Chris Snow at some point. And I think the point was I was working on the face and uh, I was planning to go back to Chris Snow next. And then the whole thing for Rod Thomas came to me. <laughs> well, there went 
the, the series for eight books. And pretty soon I was so far away from Chris Snow, and one new idea after another was coming. But I have about half that book done and have had half done for a long time. And I do not have that. That publisher uh, is gone now. And I'm still at the same house, but there's a different publisher. So, and I think they would be enthusiastic about my finishing the um, the Chris Snow trilogy. So, it will happen if people are patient. You, the only thing is, it just don't die on me. <laughs> if you just stay alive, sooner or later, that book will be there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, again, we've been speaking with Dean Koontz. His latest novel, The Silent Corner, is on sale today. So, go buy a copy or download it on your favorite ebook device. Dean, thanks for taking the time to talk about The Silent Corner and your new favorite character, Jane Hawk. Yep, thanks for having me there. Parent, volunteer, employee. With your different roles and busy schedule, how can you find time to complete the degree you once started? Cornerstone University's programs are designed for busy adults like you. Take one course at a time, back-to-back to move through your degree quickly. Attend through an on-campus, live stream, or 100% online format, whichever works best for you. If you're ready to go further in your goals, we're here to make it possible. Achieve without ceasing. Learn more at adult.cornerstone.edu. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply.